Hey y'all, it's Danielle with K6 UDA Radio, filling in for Bob today. He's on a vacation, a staycation in his bed. <laughs> he hurt his back. No, I actually said I'd be back after lunch. But thanks for filling in for me, Danny. We got a lot of stuff to cover today. Um, but one thing that I noticed is there's a ton of you guys that watch this from QRZ and Facebook and some other external sources and you're not going to YouTube to watch this. And that's cool. But what I want you to do is look up in the, uh, uh, look on the screen here and right up here, you're gonna see a title. I want you to click on that title right now. What that's gonna do is that's gonna take you to YouTube right now and you're gonna be able to see all of the other cool stuff, all the links and everything else that I put in here that right now you're not seeing. And that way you can also hit the subscribe button, which is right down here. I wanna get to 5,000 subscribers as soon as possible because I'm sitting here on this Elecraft KX2, I wanna give this thing away. I wanna give it away before uh, Christmas. I, I'd really like to give it to one of you guys before Christmas. And I know the guys over at Elecraft would really like to do that too. This week we're gonna look at a brand new radio from B-Tech, AKA Bofang. This one is the UV5X3. It is a tri-band radio. Looking at it from the outside and turning it on, it looks almost identical. The display, the dimensions, it's slightly larger than the UV5R, but just almost identical in operation and appearance to its predecessor at half the cost. What you get with this radio is two antennas, this uh, mic and earpiece, and the charger. The side controls remain unchanged from previous versions. The monitor button serving double duty as a flashlight control and to break squelch. The call button on top is kind of interesting. It operates the FM radio so you can listen to your favorite broadcasts or by pressing and holding you can activate the uh, onboard rape whistle and broadcast uh, to everybody. Turn the unit off to disable that. Switching from memory to VFO mode is very simple. It's the red button up on top. And using the band button, you could cycle through the tri-band uh, radio. And that's why I decided to fork up 64 bucks for this new Chinese radio. Like I said before, the controls are basically unchanged from previous models. You've got the push to talk, the call button, and the monitor button on the sides. On the top, you have the familiar reverse SMA, the flashlight, and the volume on-off knob. The opposite side of the radio has the familiar uh, input for the mic and speaker that's covered uh, with a little moisture-proof cover and the little wrist strap a lanyard thing. On the back of the radio is a positive lock for the battery compartment, and that battery is virtually unchanged from previous versions. Same battery and they all fit together. Okay, the keypad has all kinds of multi-function uh, buttons, just like almost every other HT out on the market these days. No surprise there. Changing frequencies or changing channels is done with the up and down buttons. Switching between your A and B channels is relatively straightforward with the AB button. Entering a frequency into the VFO is really straightforward. You just key it in and I do like that. Moving around the menus and programming this thing is where it becomes a $64 radio and not a $200 or $300 radio. It's fairly cumbersome You've got to press the menu, find what you're looking for, press the menu again, activate what you want, and press the menu again, and then exit out in order to activate whatever you want to do. And honestly, 
when you're trying to program in uh, repeater codes and offsets, uh, that's where this thing really becomes a pain in the ass. And as typical with some of the Chinese manufacturers here, uh, their choice of labeling in the menus is really, really confusing sometimes. And I think BTEC really dropped the ball on this one. I think this was their opportunity to really move away from the eight character limitation and that small little screen, move it to a bigger screen and a more descriptive uh, labeling system. But you know, they probably don't care because they sell more of these $30 radios than probably all the other manufacturers put together. And that's really what they care about. I gotta say, they really stepped up the manual this time. Uh, it was written by US Ham, and it is really, really detailed and complete. Probably the best thing that Bofang has done in a long, long time. Get on the so, scope here. how does this thing perform? Well, I hooked it up to the scope, and we ran a few tests, uh, receive and uh, transmit. And what we got was not bad. It actually wasn't too bad. It does have a little bit more air on the transmit side, frequency air, than uh, some of the Japanese manufacturers. But you know what? It's not a highly calibrated machine. It's actually, you know, a 30 or $64 radio. And what do you expect? So there is a little bit of air or a little bit more air than you would expect in a, a higher quality machine. My biggest complaint with the radio, I not, I've got this nice little uh, tri-band radio, two meter, 220, 440, but in its stock configuration, I've got to uh, change antennas if I wanna run on the 220 band. That sucks. I mean, that, that's really a, that's a drag. The menus absolutely suck on this thing. Uh, I think that's a place where you, where you differentiate between the big three and their menuing systems and this thing. I mean, this is about as low tech as you can get. It costs twice as much as the UV5R. And what all do you get for twice as much money? The display on this is, uh, it's basic. And, and, and for twice as much money, it's time to start stepping up the display on the thing. I mean, even the, uh, the Wuxon or the, the Ocean radio uh, has a nice color display and it, you can have actual things that mean something to you. Here, everything's got to be some cryptic little, you know, six to eight character. Uh, the other thing that I'm just not wild about on this is the little rape whistle. <laughs> That's as far as I could call it. It's just this little rape whistle. I mean, you hit the thing and it just starts chirping, you know, weird. And honestly, if you don't have any 220 repeaters or you've got very few 220 repeaters in your area, this thing is not worth it at all. If you want a cheap radio, I would stick with the UV5R. So I wanted to show you guys a really cool repeater system. And seeing that I'm not an expert, I decided to go see an expert. This is Jeff, AK6OK, who owns this whole system. Now up on the hill, we have a total of five repeaters running right now. And uh, it's kind of an unusual setup. Here's one set of repeaters. We have a repeater on 22402 up in the 220 band, which by the way is one of the best bands in the world for communications. It's absolutely stunning what that thing does in the coverage. It's connected to 444.900. Now on that repeater controller, one is tied to each port and with commands and touch tones, I can tie the two together so that when you talk on one, it comes out the other and vice versa. Also on that, we have a steerable remote base. Steerable remote base means we have a UHF VHF radio and from either one, 220 or 444-900, we can use touch tones and change the frequency of that 
dual band radio could put a tri-bander in there and connect that radio to both ports also. So now you have 222, uh, 224 and 444 connected to any other repeater you want. This allows us from down in the valley here to connect to a San Francisco repeater without using Echolink or IRLP. I'm kind of a nut on this. What happens if the internet goes out? So I don't like using IRLP and Echolink, even though we have it up there. <laughs> you know, I just mentioned to you a second ago, when you try to do something with all this stuff in here and you have a problem, that problem causes another problem and another problem. And you may have spent decided to spend an hour up here and four hours later, you're still chasing problems. That's where I am right now. I'm and so our other repeater system is on 145.13 and it's connected to 444.475 using a second controller. So I have two of these ARCOM controllers up there. And uh, what it does is we have an HF remote on the third port. Now that's tied to a TS940 uh, HF radio. Amazing combination because from either 145.13 or 444.475, we can dial up touch tones and bring up the remote receiver and we can hear what's going on in HF, and we can also transmit on HF from UHF or VHF. A little bit of a licensing problem here. If you've got somebody that's not licensed to be in the extra band and we're listening on the extra band and they talk in the repeater, it's going to come out on the extra band. So we've got to be a little careful with that. But it's a terrific concept. And I built the first remote base that I've ever built, uh, HF remote, in uh, 1989. Had it up for 20 years in Granite Bay. So is all, the, is all this stuff supposed to be hooked up together? Somehow. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Are you insinuating I don't know what I'm doing? Because I really am acting like it, huh? It's... Uh, we're using on HF a 450-foot uh, long, not a long wire, it's a, a loop antenna. Loop antennas are amazing. And so it's super quiet up there. So people down in their condo projects down here in, in this area can uh, bring up the remote base and listen from there or transmit. So it's quite a system. Also, we have six meters. We have um, on uh, 51.7 and 51.2. So 51.7 is our transmit frequency. We listen on 51.2. There's a six meter repeater. We're going to be tying that into the other repeaters as well. So we'll have all these systems tied together and uh, eventually. So if you talk on one, you're talking on all of them. And uh, one reason we're doing this is that, uh, number one, experimentation and trying to make sure we do everything with RF. It's really important because the internet could go down, and it may someday. I've already seen that happen, and in an emergency, if that goes down, what are you going to do then? RF is pretty uh, reliable, and we've been using it for years this way. And uh, we're also affiliated with the uh, Office of Emergency Services and Homeland Security in Sacramento, who uses our repeater in emergencies as well. So it's quite a system, and I'm going to be writing an article for QST shortly about the whole system up there and how it works. This is what's on every, most repeaters have these. I have uh, five repeaters up and I'm only using duplexers on two of them. But what this is, this is separate cavities, two together on each side. One is for transmit, one is for receive. So what we do is we take an antenna like this and we stick it right here, right? That's the output, which goes to the antenna on top of the tower. So you have one antenna and it splits off the signal. The receive signal is on this side and the transmit signal is on this side. Now. I'm going to show you what, there's a cavity right here. This cavity is representative of one of these four cans right here, okay? So here's what one cavity does. When I hook this up, look at the spectrum analyzer here. You're going to see what happens. It lets one frequency go through, and it, not, it takes everything else out. So how this works is, is you'll see up here, right here is down 90 dB. But we've got a, a nice peak right there. That means that this is tuned right about 444.0. And if I move this tuning control, it will move that left or right. So let's say the receive frequency is 444.0 and our transmit frequency is somewhere else. Then what we do is we take this cavity, we tune it for the receive frequency, and you got two of those in series. And so that's what makes it a nice tight, tight cavity. It passes one frequency and it blocks everything else out. On the other side, we may have 445.0 as your transmit frequency. Same exact concept. These two are tuned to 445.0. These are 444.0. Same kind of a concept, but it uses a can just like this to do that. So that's how we separate it out. We put the transmit side into the transmitter and the receive side into the receiver. 
and you're transmitting and receiving on a, tra on a repeater simultaneously through the same antenna. Remember guys, we're still giving away that Elecraft KX2, so keep hitting that subscribe button if you haven't already done it. If you're on, uh, if you're watching this from QRZ or Facebook or some other external link, go ahead, hit that, that hit that button up there. When we hit 5,000 subscribers, we're giving away this KX2 to one of you lucky guys. Be sure to check out the rules that apply for you to go home with this bad boy. The K6 UDA t-shirt drive is on. It's live. A ton of you guys have told me what colors you like, tan or blue. And I'll tell you what, I need you to go to indiegogo.com and click on the link in the description. And you got to be in YouTube to see the description. Click on that link. Go to Indiegogo, check it out. You can order whatever size you want in blue or in tan. And right now tan's kind of the favorite, but uh, order the thing up. It's, uh, it's 18 bucks plus shipping, plus a couple of bucks shipping. Let's flood the world with K6 UDA radio t-shirts. They're tacky, they're fun. And, uh, and frankly, I think the girls are gonna like them. Oh, second best thing. Post yourself in the K6 UDA radio shirt. Instagram, Facebook, tag us. We will like it. We will comment on it. I will be on there and I will find you. I am slightly a stalker when it comes to social media. That's all I got this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'm Bob, K6 UDA. I'm out of here. 7-3, guys. Remote system linked. So to help K6 UDA Radio celebrate 5,000 viewers, Bob's going to do a t-shirt contest.